Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's so nice to see you. Dobry vietur, vajami, dami, gaspada. I'm so glad to see you. I see familiar faces and new faces. Welcome the students, the community, good fellow. Welcome our faculty. Welcome everyone. And um, actually, I'm not doing the welcoming, but I'm just so glad to see you. By the way, I wanted to tell you that if you come in and you don't visit that table there, and you don't come out away from the table with something on it, you will be asked to leave and sent to Siberia. <laughs> so this is your last chance while we're doing the quick introduction. Please get up and go grab something. I'm Eva Davis. I teach Russian up here. And I would like to introduce my right hand, uh, president of the Russian club. Uh, Christian Gordon. Christian Gordon. <laughs> really, I call him President Gini, President Genius. And he will do the proper introduction. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Russian enrichment program. This was put together by our Russian club with the help of our English and Modern Languages Department. Tonight we are very grateful to have Dr. Kirill Avramov as our guest speaker. And uh, after his presentation, there's going to be a short Q&A if you want to stick around and ask questions. He's accompanied by Dr. Mary Neuberger, professor, director of the Center of Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies, provost teaching fellow, I believe chair of Department Slavic of Slavic Studies. Slavic, yeah, Slavic and Eurasian Studies. All right, please introduce Dr. Kirill Abumov. So first, I just want to thank all of you for showing up tonight and all of the good folks from San Angelo for inviting us out here. We usually come once a year, different. We bring, I come once a year, bring different faculty members from the University of Texas who specialize on Russia in one form or another. So I want to thank especially Eva Davis and Jeanette McWilliams for bringing us out here and organizing this every year. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Kirill Avramov. Kirill actually got his undergrad degree here in the United States, but he's from Bulgaria originally. He had a Russian grandmother, so also grew up speaking Russian. Um, Kirill came to us at the University of Texas on a Fulbright and was there for a year, and he was actually studying conspiracy theories, um, and particularly Russian conspiracy theories, and the power of conspiracy theory in Russian information um, wars. Um, and he was here for a year, and he went back to Bulgaria for a couple of years, was teaching there. He has a position at New Bulgarian University. And we are lucky enough to get him back to the University of Texas, where he's been involved in the Intelligence Studies Project which is connected to the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and in particular their, their global studies um, kind of area up there. And there's a couple security centers up there that he's associated with. Um, and after he did that for a year and a half, we're lucky enough to have him stay one more year on a postdoctoral position. We're hoping to actually, if we can, have him stay permanently at the University of Texas, so we're working on that. Um, Kirill's specialty is in political science, and he's been doing a lot of work building on his work on conspiracy theories on Russian information warfare, particularly in Eastern Europe. So he speaks Bulgarian, but also Hungarian, so he's done a lot of work on Hungary and Bulgaria as well. So I'm really excited to introduce Kirill Abramov. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, it is a particular pleasure and it's always very humbling experience when you come to a new place and um, you have this immense interest. So it is, I hope that, uh, if not I can try to, you know, sing. <laughs> um, it is a humbling experience when you have so many eyes upon you at a new place and people have been so kind at new university. Uh, that obliges me to speak to you tonight and try to advocate several ideas uh, at a topic which is close to my heart, something that I have been working on for several years now, and I will be approaching this topic, which is the active measures renaissance and the topic of Russian political warfare from several perspectives, so, namely intelligence studies, uh, political science, but also area studies. I will try to advance certain ideas tonight, try to provoke for the Q&A uh, uh, some provocative thoughts, whether we are living in a new Cold War or we are not. 
Uh, and if not, what are we exactly looking at? And I will try to show you examples of what we are working on at UT Austin uh, and try to explain a little bit about the theory integration of what we are doing in our labs in order to boost, boost something which our military colleagues, our ROTC students are probably well familiar with and also, of course, people that are interested in area studies. A big dog in Europe and in the United States is uh, boosting the so-called cognitive resilience. So that is how to defend ourselves from uh, something that in the military is known as uh, PSYOP operations and the intelligence will look at as active measures. So if you allow me tonight, I will uh, try to outline uh, the segments as I've started. Can you hear me well or I should be even... I think this is the highest I can get. You know, I cannot you know, have the song probably, but I'll try to talk something that I'm well familiar with. So tonight I'll be talking about, uh, some, about the global context as a political scientist or some ideas of, or in our perspective of how the world looks like today as of uh, 2019. Try to remind, especially, uh, I'm sure that people here that have witnessed or had experience with the Cold War immediately Paul probably recognized from the title saying, oh, active measures, active meropriati paruski. Those are well familiar um, actions and ideas which have been weaponized during the Cold War. But for our younger students, I will advocate the idea that actually we're living in, in a uh, context and an environment into which this is the most suitable instrument in asymmetric situation that we're looking in a near-peer competition. So I'll try to refresh our minds what the active measures are. Also, try to outline the role specifics and functionality of the global uh, implementations of those updated uh, active measures or how they are implemented throughout um, on new platforms such as social media and some new channels that they might be delivered. Talk a little bit about the toolbox uh, and of course I will try to concentrate tonight about the kinetic or the non-kinetic side of it uh, and of course on the Q&A we can talk a little bit about what kinetic uh, active measures are and talk of course at the end what our work at UT Austin constitutes of in terms of analytics of those weaponized narratives, culture and ideation that I saw on this very nice poster that has been put out here for which I'm thankful to our colleagues at this university. So um, let's start a little bit about the context uh, and all of us probably will agree that we live of something that uh, dictionaries and it used to be very fashionable such as Oxford Dictionary a couple of years ago were saying that the word of the year is post-truth. So we live in post-truth reality which is driven by something which a lot of people will talk about as alternative facts or alternative uh, knowledge. So the idea is that perception of all of us and perception, of course, are the stimuli that we are getting from outside and we are trying to build up understanding of what's going on around us, such in terms of awareness, is built by those stimuli that are having different degrees of truthness to them, if you will. So what we observe uh, in different establishments, not only in the intelligence community, but also in the defense community, is that we cannot deny that we are seeing persistent Russian political warfare, uh, warfare, warfare efforts and operations that directly target uh, US, NATO, and uh, a lot of EU member countries on the old continent. And what we uh, observe is that those operations tend to be to work in tandem. And uh, the parts, if you want to think about them, they have sometimes kinetic uh, elements and sometimes they do have non-kinetic. And of course, uh, I've been approached by a member uh, of, of the audience already, and um, he was asking me, well, I've heard the name Gerasimov, right? And, uh, of course, the chief of staff of the uh, Russian Federation, General Gerasimov, of course, his name pops up immediately in this context because people recognize, I wouldn't go as far as to call it doctrine, I would subscribe to the more conservative uh, opinion of uh, people like Mark Galeotti, people that know very well. Uh, uh, Russian security establishment and reality, and I would say that uh, no, but it's very influential thinker who has proposed uh, in his, one of his major articles a couple of years ago, which became very, very popular within the Russian uh, Siloviki establishment. I hope uh, you associate this word, Siloviki is the fraction of uh, people that have gained their education or experience either in the defense or the intelligence community, like Mr. Putin himself. Uh, so they have very peculiar way of perceiving and uh, of threat perception and framing friends and foes, if you will. 
So he says four to one are non-kinetic or informational um, measures to kinetic uh, operations. This is how the new wars will be fought. So I'll get back to, to this very influential idea which he has formulated in response to one of the greatest fears of the Russian political establishment today. Uh, and this is what they call color revolutions or the effects of what they're seeing as liberalization of societies, mainly through the lessons that they've seen after the Arab Spring. So, um, of course, uh, those influence operations uh, are very specific uh, within the Russian doctrine and they, uh, you know, go in concert with very specific uh, ideological um, ideation which, or ide uh, ideological spin to which I will show you with the meta narratives. They integrate and I'll try to advance the idea that what you're seeing sometimes, the sensory overload of the so-called fake news and conspiracy theories, they are not random. They comply to a theories which were developed very well in the Soviet Union and are tied all the way to Pavlovian conditioning. Mainly, of course, is the theory of reflexive control when you are trying to work with your uh, competitor or adversary. So, so far, it sounds scary, right? <laughs> but it actually is an integral part of how you do a non-Western covert action. So what we are looking at in essence is a covert action and its modus operandi. And of course, what we are interested, as I've told you in our university, is to understand what the, the forms, the typology, and the themes which we can select from the harvested data that we can positively attribute um, to ongoing uh, Russian operations and to understand what is the so-called harm grade. So one way to look at it, we're looking at all of those false or disinformation which is specifically tail or tailored to either smaller communities or even sometimes at individuals. We are interested to see what is the potential to, uh, for them to modify something what we call the trifecta. And that is uh, the perception of the individual, the cognition, the understanding, and most importantly, behavioral changes. And if you think that those things are rather abstract, I will try to uh, show you in a second, you know, uh, pictures, which I'm sure you pretty much will recognize it, and immediately we can do this mental game together. You know, what actually out of the trifecta can, we, uh, can be attributed to um, uh, those changes which are sought after. So what are active measures? Uh, the definition of active measures is actually acts influencing events and behavior uh, and actions of foreign countries, groups, or individuals. Uh, they ra range from political, informational, and cultural to the hard component, military maneuvers, assistance to paramilitary insurgents and terrorists, and physical eliminations. Uh, they, I would argue, are one of the most important tools currently Russia has in the context of what is known as nonlinear uh, warfare, or you probably know it better by the uh, term hybrid. I am avoiding it for a reason because hybrid implies other things as well. So also what uh, they are very good for, I would argue, their applications of those instruments are very well suitable for what today is known as the gray zone. So what is the gray zone? Zone. Uh, I think there is an excellent discussion by Hall Brands about what uh, gray zone is today or not. But we can all possibly agree that the world as we see in it today um, is, uh, uh, especially the, the intensive competition that we are seeing in certain area, is not neither peace nor full-blown war. So basically, you have this gray area of operation in between. Uh, in, in which it's like, um, how many of you have looked at the sport of water polo? You're familiar? Yes, ma'am. So what can we see on the top of it? A lot of, you know, kind of like up to here, people kind of gently swimming and doing all those things. What happens underneath? Exactly. It is, it is brutal. Yes, sir. Oh, um, so uh, it is gray zone because um, gloves, are, gloves are off, but no one has declared uh, war on anyone. So we, we're, we're smiling, but we're trying to kick each other underneath with ev all the power that we're having. And <coughs> when I'm talking about kinetic and non-kinetic, in order to uh, stay away from the abstract, I will try to ask you whether you can recognize some of the pictures uh, or the events that are depicted in my slides. So when I say kinetic, I'm thinking about these gentlemen here. And these gentlemen are known, of course, affectionately as what? The Salisbury tourists. 
Uh, one of them supposedly is selling, and I, of course I'm, I'm trying to uh, keep it a little bit humorous because these gentlemen, as you see, are intelligence officers which were trained, tried to carry out uh, an attempt on the life of these people here, which of course by now are well hidden in anonymity. Uh, and the pictures I have taken are from the work of uh, uh, OSINT investigations such as what Bellingcat would do and done an excellent job of tracking uh, and disclaiming uh, the claims of the Russian government today that actually this operation, these people never existed and they've done something else. So that's a very typical sort of um, updated kinetic or active measure uh, with kinetic component. Uh, and of course, you know, hardly you can deny when you're, you know, when you're pictured in your military years and when you picture entering Britain. So these people were the ones trying to eliminate somebody who was um, talking too much according to um, Putin's inner circle. So kinetic. When I say kinetic, of course, we can go broader. And we can look at uh, this fellow Cossack uh, and, of course, uh, some other faces that I have specifically taken out, again, proven already. These uh, gentlemen are all members of the GRU, which got its name back, or the Military Intelligence of Russia, and they were all involved in the failed coup d'etat in Montenegro. Uh, so another example of uh, failed kinetic active measure, which remind very much, as I'm trying to uh, advance the idea, of actions which the Soviet government used to do without sometimes the heavy ideological component. Uh, if we go further, Kinetic is something else which I do at University of Texas. Um, it is a project that we are tracking the so-called uh, mercenaries, which were the non-existent private military companies. You probably read in the papers or heard somewhere the name Wagner and uh, some other names of ghost companies. But think about those people that actually had heads-on collision uh, with the U.S. armed forces in Syria and took casualties which Kremlin denies or in, uh, you know, um, the parlance, ich tam niet. They don't exist. So uh, they don't exist for a number of reasons, but they're instrumental. Uh, and later on, I can answer a lot of questions because this project took a lot of our time of where these people are. I just want you to think that reemergence of, of this type of covert action has placed these people as far as Central African Republic. And I want you to think about in historical terms, uh, from the 90s and the implosion of uh, uh, the USSR, how far we've, Mr. Putin has taken in the, the different mandates to reach out of the Russian Federation. And of course, Libya, a number of other uh, localities. Some people claim even up to Venezuela. When we talk about non-kinetic, I hope you will recognize immediately some other faces. And uh, this is, uh, for all of you that you're not familiar, this is Margarita Simonian. Uh, she is one of the most prominent journalists and head of RT. And if you remember, RT is just the sanitized version of what I would say the Russian Information Ministry's outreach most effective machine. It's Russia Today. It has been shortened for American and English speaking audiences because Russia, especially in the wake of all the political turmoil, and I think that bears in the name Russia, might look a bit suspicious. So RT is a little bit more sanitized and of course it's little brother Sputnik. Uh, for those of you interested later on you can check Sputnik's uh, broadcasting to understand the updated version of TASS and how many languages it started broadcasting targeting very specific auditoria in Spanish, in English, in all languages uh, uh, important and regions deemed important in uh, uh, doctrine uh, of uh, foreign policy and military doctrine in the Russian Federation. And of course, I have selected this just to uh, illustrate that, of course, Simonian would always deny that this is tied to the political, uh, Russian political uh, 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 contemporary warfare. But in her own words, look at uh, the year, and 2008 is an important year. As you can remember, it is the year into which Russia and Georgia went into a hot phase where Russia actually has demonstrated in this conflict that it has learned all the lessons from First and Second Chechen War, but before that, all the frozen conflicts around its borders, and try to argue that they have something known as integrated operation into which the winning of hearts and minds, as we will say it in this, on this side of the world, is also very important. So strategic messaging is coming back full vengeance, and look, it, she admits that we were conducting an information war in the uh, entire Western world. 
Uh, of course, uh, to be a little bit more updated, uh, I am looking at two current events. Uh, that is British humor, and it's taking a picture out of Britain. And of course, right now, uh, the activity is probably surrounding all the separatist movements, mainly Catalonia, Scotland, and so on. Uh, how do we know this? Well, we see constantly a rise uh, on social networks and some other activities associated with strategic messaging in support of separatist movements. And it's a story in itself why the Russian Federation is so invested currently into backing up. And because we're in Texas, if we think that this thing is really far away from us, I want you to think about heart of Texas. But before that, for unsuspecting, unsuspecting public, and I would love also to have to be invited in Bastrop, because I think this was you know, the locality that kind of was exemplary. Uh, in 2015, uh, the smaller kind of PSYOP operations against this, the people of the state which was conducted was during the Jade Helm 15 exercise into which uh, later on ODNI, ex-ODNI, uh, was admitting that uh, the push of a strategic narrative that led to uh, modification. Are you familiar, anyone here in the audience, what I'm talking about? Well, I'm talking about how our governor was, um, and I'll explain a little bit in the dynamics how that happens, was pushed to ask the national or the, the, the uh, state guard to monitor the, the activities of the federal army. And I think that whoever has done on the other side, because the idea of psychological uh, uh, warfare and operations that our military colleagues would know, it is moving and you know, turning events and winning without killing. So someone probably sitting away was sitting and doing I was able to do that without putting uh, a person on the ground, but I was able to influence events. And I think this was a little bit the taste kind of like a smaller victory before moving on to 2016 on a much larger scale to try to target very uh, important and well-placed um, constituency in order to expect certain result. And of course, here um, beyond Texas, uh, there was another well-documented uh, attempt, although with uh, lesser success, and it was the interest of the Russian political warfare uh, where, and um, military and intelligence establishment and uh, the so-called California succession movement. Um, and of course, if you switch on tonight Russian TV and you look something like Bolshaya Igra or Vrema uh, Pakajet, uh, you will see that um, even civilians would talk constantly about this very important uh, uh, sort of in their minds um, precedent which is connected to Kosovo uh, and which kind of opens um, uh, the genie out of the bottle has been released and this is kind of gives you a free hand to, to go and back all kinds of separatist movements. Uh, later on of course I'll try to uh, argue why is that. Um, also um, 2015 very quickly this is pictures taken from the conservative forum in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, as you can see, this is probably the first attempt to create something which is known as the Black International. Uh, far right parties uh, and uh, guess what? With American presence as well. Um, this will s give um, limited success, but also of course is instrumentalized at least on two occasions because these people will be the fellow travelers, if you will. And in the words wrongly um, attributed to Lenin, possibly to be the useful idiots of a machine which is looking for its own interest. So you can see the Cossacks, uh, you can see the representatives, the British, Greek, and so on, far right, and the American representative. So uh, later on I can talk about uh, that. And of course I've taken the nesting dolls here because uh, you are probably well aware that if you're asking what are the trails and why we think so, um, you know, probably one of the best uh, methods to follow uh, law enforcement methods is kind of saying follow the money, right? Well, the money trail uh, goes to Le Pen, uh, goes to a number of other people which have been bankrolled by Putin's regime uh, with the expectation of good performance in their respective countries. Uh, and of course, um, um, uh, good performance will translate later on into policy shifts. Um, and last but not least, if you recognize uh, some attempts which have confused even, uh, in this case, the family of uh, Mr. Trump, uh, which were telltale signs also of those active measures that I'll be talking about. This would be the lawyer Veselnitsky, which promises dirt on the Democrats, but actually comes and starts talking about entirely different issue, 
which tells us something about the mindset of the inner circle of uh, the Russian Federation. So basically, she was talking about Magnitsky Act and lifting down the sanctions, uh, lifting up the sanctions, and all things which were important and are still important uh, in the minds of the Russian leadership. Uh, possibly you can recognize this lady. Uh, this is the updated version of. Um, um, uh, Anna Chapman, possibly. I'm thinking of previous iterations of people that were trying to attempt to implant themselves into the establishment and look for uh, possible alterations on this trifecta that I'm talking about. Just in case, uh, I have specifically selected this picture down at the bottom. You can see that she's in a company of very important people, such as uh, Torshin, deputy head of uh, the Central Bank of, of the Russian Federation. Some people which have uh, prominence and bearing in the Russian establishment. Okay, so what are the elements of uh, uh, the active measures? Well, the classical uh, sort of um, uh, active measures theory, which was developed, uh, and it is could be attributed its first roots all the way back to the Tsarist Okranka, which is the first one that has circulated and weaponized the protocols of the elders of Zion in order to uh, solve political issues. Then go to political warfare, uh, which could be attributed to the zeal of the Yesteka Partia, the vanguard. Uh, so think about Lenin and think about how Trotsky ends up and where. Uh, and go different iterations within the Soviet, um, as Soviet science advances, military, psychology, uh, and so on. Well, all those elements tend to be integrated into operations in order to achieve foreign policy or military goals. One of them, most importantly, I would argue, is maskirovka. Uh, literally deception, but it actually it is larger than the concept of simple military deception because it incorporates a lot of broader idea of what Russians are thinking about it. Uh, provocation, penetration, forgery, sabotage, um, agents of influence, clandestine work, conspiracy, we can read the Russian text, of course, disinformation, uh, and the so-called mokre dela, wet jobs, uh, and the combination of thereof. I think that if we go back, and I'm not going to play the pictures, one again, you will see that each and every element will almost check a box, and or the combination of. So um, my uh, idea today, or the first hypothesis I was trying to argue with you, is that active me measures are not random. And they're not random. Of course, right now I'm taking out the kinetic, the James Bond S part. Uh, and we will just concentrate on the winning hearts and minds or um, trying to influence perception, cognition, and behavior. They comply with something which is known as reflexive control theory. And uh, it has been conducted or studied and developed for over 40 years in the Soviet Union and then updated in, in, uh, in um, modern Russia. It is both military and civilian uses and stems from two concepts. One of them is reflection of what we know. And here that will explain why we are uh, doing symmetric responses, Dr. Newberger, why we are actually looking from in our lab to be attached with area studies. This is why the importance to know history, language, and context so well, because you cannot try to uh, run operations or block certain operations uh, according to reflex control theory if you don't know the context really intimately well. And the cybernetic concept of control. So uh, basically, sort of the grand idea, and of course someone would say, well, how, you know, that, that really looks like, you know, game theory in Western sense, and you would be correct. This would be more or less the Soviet answer, uh, which was um, partially um, classified and later on declassified at, uh, at the onset of democracy. But the idea is to locate the weakest link in the system and exploit it through moral uh, arguments, psychological tactics, or uh, exploit certain features in the leadership's character that you know very well in order to achieve um, uh, desired ends. How's that done? Uh, well, think about at least two steps. One of them is the transformation of enemies' information collection. Uh, that is means, means selecting what kind of messages they will transmit and uh, controlling how they consume that. And this is this information and camouflage. Uh, I'm not going to go very, uh, you know, in deep that, you know, in Q&A so we can have uh, time for, for questions. But this is the main elements of this theory. It at least has four components. And it has to do something with what are the goals of the people on the other side of your adversary. What is um, 
your solution uh, algorithm or that is to understand how people take decisions and this would explain why you would send people let's say all the way to NRA it's not because they love too, much, too many guns or so on it is probably they want to understand how decisions are taken into smaller groups into larger groups and how people form their desired outcomes and of course um, later on you're trying to control the reflex of your enemy so for those of you that let's say are keen on tennis or even box this is exactly or even you know I would say chess of course but that's cliche right is the idea that you're trying to condition and skew the perception of your enemy and try to take him off balance uh, and on tops of everything for him to think that he's making independent decisions uh, which are beneficial only to himself so uh, without um, kind of like um, applying uh, coercion uh, or hard force so um, why should we bother with that at all somebody would say okay well this has been around probably since time immemorial right and you would say well how's that different from propaganda well I would argue that for in the past four years uh, we have a renaissance as my the title of my presentation has in the gray zone activities of those active measures and they peaked and they peaked into very different locations and of course later on we can I will try to answer if there are questions why precisely they have picked uh, beyond even places as uh, hot theaters such as Ukraine uh, and gone all the way, if you can believe it, to Madagascar. Uh, and you have uh, a Russian Politechnologi, uh, which are sent to all the ways to help uh, certain candidates win uh, in their respective countries. Uh, and they usually come as what we call in a package. Uh, and this is military aid, this is masked people which are private military companies and so on, which makes them a perfect package for dictators. I want you to think about Bashar Assad and what you get. You get the whole package and support because it is an insurance policy. So, uh, but for the people in the West, why should we bother? Well, we, uh, I believe we should bother and here probably will be a standard sort of thing that uh, our colleagues will hear is, uh, also in NATO forums, but also armed forces forums because we are having uh, to deal with something that hits multiple targets simultaneously and tests the cognitive resilience of civilians and military personnel alike. So they also seek to uh, achieve long-term effects. It's not necessarily from theory of propaganda, for those of you familiar with that, would know that they're not necessarily looking for short-term effects. Usually short-term effects are associated with behavioral changes when you're looking for immediate uh, uh, change of course but some of those are working with a very long targets uh, or long expectations so it is very uh, concerning um, how is it concerning um, well they're concerning because it is not only this playbook is already open not only to what Russian Federation has perfected and mastered I would I would argue but also it is used by other what we uh, what we with coin sharp powers and those are powers that would use information asymmetry and the asymmetry which exists between in popperian terms closed and open societies so in society like ours we reach decisions through deliberation it's a messy process it's a slow process but and it's open because we have multiple inputs try to do that in today's china or even russia why because those stimuli had to be closed and you can exploit the openness of other systems. And this is very well known from the totalitarian practice of uh, ideological warfare. So um, I would also argue that this renaissance is dangerous because what we are seeing is that we're having erosion of national boundaries, but also a limited and growing limits of centralized response. And this would be very valid for some of the um, uh, allies of this country in Europe. Um, you don't have the resources sometimes to react and to shield yourself and it requires something which is really hard probably the perennial problem in political or social sciences it requires collective action so uh, there are different levels of reliance on IT technologies in different countries some people like this country has you know light years ahead in using um, 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 IT services and so on and later on I'll just catch out what kind of possible futures we might have with integration of artificial intelligence into this whole process uh, but some are not and yet 
you can think of how those instruments, if you have the correct mix, you can push them in the right direction. So they are pretty universal. Um, what is the ideological climate if we are talking from the perspective of the West? Very quickly, populist backlash in the US, the US and EU. Um, Russia here, of course, uses this asymmetry to push its idea. And here again, sir, you were asking me what Surkovism is. Surkov was the inventor of the so-called term um, or sovereign democracy. This is the idea that you can have a managed political system, very, very different from liberal democracy, democracy in name only, uh, which is applicable outside of context of Russia and which is to be an attractive model for defense centers or people that are thinking that liberal democracy may be a failed or multiculturalism and so on are failed experiments. And you can see that the populists are using this very heavily. Now, just a reminder, have you remembered part of these populists on which picture and in which city we have captured them? It was St. Petersburg. <laughs> when I say this populist, you know, they also are part of this far right people are part of this populist wave. Also, very importantly in our societies, and we can judge it by ourselves, we are witnessing a humongous pushback against experts. It's what you know, some colleagues are calling the death of expertise. We don't want to listen anymore to people that uh, claim that they're specialized in a certain field. It is everybody's an author, everybody has an opinion, which is great you know, because it is, demo, uh, it, it is democratization and with the idea that we can liberalize and have multiple voices. The problem is that when the expertise is gone, the void is filled immediately by people, and you would think, give me an example. How about the anti-vaxxer debate and what you're having afterwards? Because you can be a professor of medicine and try you know, to have all the unattractive scientific arguments and try to explain that those things have a bearing, but how much more attractive and easy is to be in the offense? And I want you to think that some of those influence operations are exactly designed to push just to give the enough inertia for the people to go in their own way because the end effect will be beneficial one way or another. And I'll try to argue why it would be beneficial. And here, a big uh, kind of caveat I want to make and make sure. Um, we love Russian culture. We love everything Russian. Here we're talking about specific authoritarian way of governance and its goals and not the people of Russia. This is very important. So. <clears throat> Also, what we are seeing, global revival of liberalism, which I'm talking about, and of course, Russia's push and this ideological, at least two fractions of the governing sort of elites of Russia, one of them being Sudoviki, the other one being the orthodox uh, religious fraction, are very interested in, and, and I want you to think about this, if USSR was all about export of universal techno-religion, which was pushing uh, to export revolution, right, all across the globe, and you know, different people were kind of uh, talking to each other, you know, whether it could be socialism or communism in one country, we should do it in steps, or we should go uh, constantly on a push, you know, different uh, ideas. Where here, what we're seeing is uh, people not only like Dugin, but other influential thinkers which are saying, look, um, Russia is the prime backer today of conservative values. It is the prime exporter, if you will, of counter uh, revolution. So very, very big contrast of what USSR and not. And uh, that will be one of the inconsistency which Mr. Putin has to battle and his ideologues because they have two overlapping images which are not necessarily sticking together. And yet, Mr. Putin thinks, for instance, that the biggest um, geopolitical tragedy is the fall of the USSR. Um, also, uh, what, you, what we're seeing, last but not least, is the rise of tele-Twitter politics. It's a genre which we are accustomed in this country. However, this type of communication also opens doors for manipulation, uh, which uh, I will try to describe a little bit uh, in detail uh, in a second. And of course, the whole idea of politics and social engagement as infotainment and spectator sports. So now the idea is that you just sit on the side, cheer, and certain segments only are engaged uh, into real collective action. Uh, very quickly, in terms of technology, increasing speed of information transmission, very important. Interconnectivity, you cannot escape it. Uh, even if you try to reduce your digital footprint, you cannot live outside of those things which are happening. And the rise of alternative sources of information. This is tied to the debt of authority. 
the good old uh, editorial sort of functions are fading away and now everybody is trying to push their agenda and point which is heavenly music if you're an intel officer because it is very easy now or relatively easier to pass by think about if you had the bbc standards constantly and later on from q a session i can tell you how soviets overcame that and it cost much more uh, than what you have here um, so excellent external conditions for man manufacturing unreality what peter pomerantz of coins unreality and weaponizing information um, now, let's go very quickly at the receiver, and this is input from uh, your regular sort of um, psychological um, perspective. Individual limits. Now, we do have what is known as parallel overflow. So think about ever-increasing information coupled with decreasing attention spans. You don't want to listen and, you know, that much more, but you're having a deluge of information. Also, this information comes in decentralized information flows. So the idea is that when it is micro-targeted, that means custom tailored to you, there is something which uh, is sought after specifically in those operations that is the bounded rationality effect, which basically is uh, the sort of the combination between cognitive limitations, which we might have, imperfect information under time constraints. The idea is that you would produce suboptimal decisions. Now remember reflexive control theory? So the idea is to keep you constantly with, you know, if possible, or at least for longer periods, or at least periods into which you are tied to key decision making, or in processes where you can put or exert pressure and create leverage over your key decision makers. So um, those are the prime times what you're doing and those cognitive attacks that we're studying. So uh, who, you know, executes those? Well, troll farms, bots, social engineering, and of course, who are they targeting? Uh, we also have this um, big conversation with our colleagues from uh, the engineering departments and people that are doing with the quantitative models, which do fantastic work. Uh, however, what we try to advance as an idea is that in these type of operations, it is not so much, it, technology is very important how it is delivered, but you always try to target the weakest link. And the weakest link is what? The person behind the machine. Uh, this is how you get uh, an entry to the system, if you will. So how do you exploit those things? Well, some of them you can exploit at cognitive level the biases, or those are the heuristics, the shortcuts of our brain, how we process, and they're very, very useful gifts from evolution, if you will, that we've been handing out. But they can be also, uh, as what we know from Fursky and Kahneman, a doors into which you can attack individual knowledge, well-being, and so on. Why? Because all of those biases that we have could be taken advantage of. And you'll see that most of the attacks, what we are seeing, are classical system one attacks uh, in, th in terms of thinking fast and slow and or peripheral, peripheral route. Simply said, to leave the jargon, it means that it, you always are trying to tip your opponent's perception or understanding by throwing him in a situation into which, you know, remember the overflow is coupled with um, disinformation which is targeted to your primal feelings, mainly fear, disgust, so on. I can go down the line and you would see that they are ever present and what we are looking for into those mosaics and families, those information ones that when they align vertically become really powerful instrument and this is when you have a go. Um, so, uh, very quickly, uh, what we know uh, in terms of quantitative proof of why you know, we think we are in uncharted waters is that three marked differences puts us, put us in a very different situation of what, let's say, in comparison to Soviet propaganda. We had, first of all, uh, spread and speed. MIT study from last year has proven that false information on Twitter, how many of you are using Twitter or Facebook? Almost everyone, right? Travels six times faster than factual information. I think that is very, very telltale sign of what's going on. And you would always think, why would people actually engage and retweet and repass fake news or, or uh, unchecked information? It has to do something with uh, what, how we think and what we are. But it's a fact. Number two, 
disinformation targeting. And I would think that here is what we've seen on the news, and all of us probably hopefully followed or not followed. This is where the future lies and poss possibly the darker future lies. When, I'm, when I talk about it, try to think about uh, Cambridge Analytica scandals. They were all tied to something very specific, and it's tied to the idea of harvesting personal traits. They were looking at ocean traits, of course, and try to create a psychological profile for each user and the use. And when we enter a very powerful algorithm, which is parsing through, and it's pretty accurate, and just to give you an example, if you look at um, some of the advances in psychiatry in this country, AI is really good in, telling, in, in, in helping m medical doctors to diagnose an incoming, let's say, depression or a condition, usually about, you know, right now the boundary to my understanding is somewhere between 7 to 15 days prior to occurrence. So think about that. Uh, now what these guys were claiming here, you know, that's the evil genius, uh, in Cambridge Analytica, and this is why it garners so much attention. What they were trying to tell you is that one of the algorithms, based on the harvested data of your likes, independently of what you have liked, will tell us more after the 100 like of what your real sexuality is, what is your political um, preference, and so on. Now, whether this is good science or junk science, right, right now, you know, we can leave it. But if we can know more about what your spouse knows that has lived with you for more than years. That should be of concern because that becomes a very powerful weapon. And number three, disinformation in post truth contexts. Very hard to form a parsing mechanism if the speed is that big and we're able to custom tailor feeds. Just think about it that your feed and your telephone when you're clicking is very, very different from mine. So what you're seeing is the echo chamber effect. So sometimes what you're consuming might be very, very different from what I'm consuming based on prior stable behavior. So what does Russia want in this very uh, context? Well, I would argue that after 2007 Munich conference speech, which is a turning point, it actually wants something very simple and should be well understood by now. First of all, promote multipolar world, world order, ending the US hegemony and primacy and having an alternative. Uh, make Kremlin an unavoidable factor in IR. That is, don't push me to the end of the table, don't ignore me anymore. Because I will retaliate, and I will retaliate in, those, in, in this manner, outside of proxy conflicts. And of course, to advance and fortify or push back what they are seeing as encirclement by NATO or Western forces away from Russian borders. This is what Russia wants in this environment. So. <laughs> Of course, uh, kind of cliche or not, but uh, it's taken actually from an interview, a real one. I have kind of like wanted to harvest and says, listen to me and listen to me carefully. He was pretty angry and talking about Russian citizens and Ukraine. I think you can imagine how that conversation ends up with uh, the journalist. So it's a thinly veiled threat. That's the idea. Um, okay. Um, I think I covered a little bit about the asymmetric approach, so on, so we will go forward. Those operations, why are they interest of the Intel studies, to, uh, to Intel studies, but also other area studies, especially, and so on, because they are curated, uh, in Russian, uh, by usually members of the various intelligence services of Russia, uh, which uh, have overlapping roles. They're very, very different from what we have in this country and its 17 agencies. Sometimes they're having competing um, objectives, and sometimes they have spectacular, in recent years, successes. And I want you to think about Crimea, which it was a brilliant operation uh, from not only kinetic perspective, but also from informational one. You can think of uh, even the local Dobrovolce were also surprised by the timing of the little green man. Why? Because they kept all the principles correct. And of course, not so spectacular, think about Eastern Ukraine and other operations because you cannot replicate sometimes uh, the external conditions which you're working for. But um, also, um, hacking of the doping agency and a number of other attempts which are well documented and become very um, discussed publicly. So, words are weapons, I hope you would agree by now, uh, which I'm trying to sell you the second idea. Uh, and why Greece? Uh, well, Greece and other centers from our perspective know best where I would argue the little lab for those 
experiments is, and this has always been Eastern Europe, center and Eastern Europe. Why? Uh, because um, Eastern Europe currently experiences where countries of, of Eastern Europe after transition exhibit perfect conditions into which you can have low cost, low risk, similar information operations executed, uh, which later on could be expanded. Uh, so uh, where is this new battlefield I'm arguing in those countries, including Poland? Well, it is the good old public discourse into which what you are seeing usually is uh, tactics which we, we call ambush from the margins. So it is marginal uh, influence operations through marginal um, outlets which are trying to reverberate information that to be implanted in the main mainstream so it become a public issue and this way you can polarize people. Uh, who do you target? Rationally uninformed people and usually people which are discontent I'm going to use a little bit harder word, but this is coming from uh, your transitional economics. Uh, and this is the losers of transition. This is the heavily targeted group, people that have a grudge or exhibit socialist nostalgia. Also, um, if you are looking to this uh, alternative influence, uh, what else makes these uh, countries very good for first testing ground before you move to bigger and better things? Well, they're NATO and EU countries, member countries. They are part of the ex-communist bloc. They have something what we know as split loyalties, deep cleavages between Russophiles and Russophobes. It is the, one of the first sort of markers on which side of how do you read history. Um, also, uh, these populations have been also um, long exposed to Soviet propaganda, so they are familiar uh, and the people that craft such disinformation are well familiar with certain condition responses that you might get. And um, I think that um, uh, my colleagues this summer, when they were over in Ukraine, they were looking at um, uh, the Ukrainian election process with Zelensky. Dr. Neuberger had a team. Uh, also was looking how you can work with generational politicians also very quickly local ones pick up the cues such as Zelensky understood very well that in order to talk to young people you know he needs to go on Instagram not on Facebook because Facebook is for a different generation and people that wanted to you know spread disinformation went through specific channels in order to target specific populations Russian speaking population geographically located depending you know and you can look at that how do we know this when we look at let's say the Russian Facebook ads and the landing pages you can pretty much tell who was what was the thinking of the targeter at the time okay and last but not least those are countries with weaker institutions where you can see democratic backslide and you know entrenched corruptions what you know better conditions to work with uh, people on the spot also last but not least those are countries with well spread and uh, something that we've been studying since 2016, conspiratorial mindset. So think about in this country, for instance, Hofstadter onwards, there is a long tradition about studying the American mind, uh, how it is perceiving conspiratorial or real ideation. Of course, I would avoid uh, the word real, but um, it was always thought as a marginal phenomenon, five to seven percent, which is that means that does not pose threat to consensus, consensus politics. What we are seeing currently, purely quantitatively in Europe and in this country, unfortunately, you see a peak most likely correlated between the rise of populism and the rise of uh, conspiratorial mindset. That means that more and more people are buying off those alternative ideas and willing to accept argumentation, which I would, you know, quote, uh, I would um, argue is something which we can call the rusty uh, razor of oakum, right? So <laughs> it just doesn't work, but it hurts, you know, because it can have a lot of uh, damage done. So what is the toolbox? Uh, fake news, conspiracy theories, compromats, here is a good word, you know, silent forgeries and public forgeries. They can come in all kinds of uh, compromising information and believe me, it is a powerful blackmail uh, mechanism as us Eastern Europeans would know. Uh, and also, I think uh, the leaders of this country unfortunately have forgotten some of the lessons what we have learned in the 80s uh, and it was probably, the, you know, the, those were distilled during Reagan years uh, with the Committee of uh, Active Measures. Uh, all this knowledge, because it was exploited from JFK onwards, uh, every mistake that um, this, uh, you know, the elites and non-elites were making in order to gain influence. 
rumors and of course, of course, altered images and footage, which is known today as deep fakes and becomes very big problem in a sense that if it is weaponized, um, one of our colleagues, Professor Bobby Chesney, for instance, if you read Lawfare blog, will see that there is a lot of talk about regulation of what you do because um, today, the worst you can get, you know, the public, and unfortunately that already has happened, is that if a person's head is so realistically exchanged and you become involuntarily part of adult mo movie and, you know, that destroys your reputation, think about a uh, political leader of a nuclear superpower delivering a speech that he never delivered and that creates false inputs for everyone who's listening. So. Uh, uh, I will, since I'm taking too much time today, uh, I will uh, try to argue two more things and then later on in the Q&A, if, if there is time for Q&A at all, <laughs> uh, to try to tell you what we do in the lab, you know, in terms of, uh, I'm not going to throw more theory, uh, but try to uh, argue that what you're seeing also uh, is a jiu-jitsu approach in terms of um, a narrative crafting. Uh, of the targeters. So basically what you're having this curved mirror, which is not very nice, which is put in front of our faces and our leadership and it's been transmitted to the publics outside not, and sometimes um, publics within this country. And you're trying to say, look, this is what you're seeing. You don't like it, what you see. And especially the alienated publics and let's say center and Eastern Europe are saying, well, yes, I mean, this is what America looks like. This is what the West looks like. Why? Because you magnify the defects, right? And try to minimize uh, what is uh, the positives. Um, I'll skip very quickly and uh, just go through the meta narratives which we're observing in the lab. Uh, as I said, for people that are interested later on the theory, we can get in touch. But think about the meta narratives such as Third Rome, uh, the unique uh, sort of mission of Russia. Third Rome is a meta narrative which has been, and uh, when I say meta narrative, just clarification, this is the big uh, cognitive and cultural schemata which people will immediately recognize, not only targeted populations, but people at home. So when you say Third Rome, you know, you have First Rome, you have Byzantine Empire, so the defender of Christianity, of course, is Russia. So you have a divine mission. So you are trying to create a situation for people where you, can, you need to make a binary choice. And this, because it's an eschatological battle, you know, between good and evil. So you have to make a choice. You can't just stay back. Uh, another one which is very important uh, and it's geared again towards our psychology. When, you, when we root, you know, in sports, usually for two teams, who do we go for to cheer for? The underdog, right? Well, Russia is the global underdog. It is besieged. It has been uh, pushed back and so on. So look, it deserves all the sympathy in the world and because it's trying to defend its people, its territory. Why? Because it is, number four, besieged fortress. It is besieged fortress because all the foreign powers, all the way back to Napoleon, you know, have done one and the same thing. Invade and try to dismember. So this is sort of a narrative that if you are trying to mobilize your own people and people that sympathize with you, it's very powerful. It's rally around the flag, up in arms. Also, eternal victim uh, for the Slavic world is very important because it says it's Slavic of, uh, and, and you'll see a lot within the Ukrainian conflict, you know, this narrative being capitalized. Torch bearer of progress um, and of course unique that has a medical, uh, mystical bridge, bridge between Europe, Asia and, uh, you know, this is sort of the new essence of Eurasianism, if you will. And of course, you see that all the logic sometimes is not, is not straight here. The, Rays are also sometimes rusty. It is invincible war power. You know, no one was able to conquer us. We'll never give up. Um, how those are incorporated? Those are incorporated in those uh, disinformation stories that I was talking about to you. And of course, mainly in this uh, conspiracy ideation that we are also collecting, uh, analyzing, and trying to see how it has been used in very particular um, uh, situations. Interestingly enough, what we know so far, it correlates really well, uh, believe it or not, with the Russian internal political calendar. So there is a peak, uh, and it seems that they're seeking uh, sort of double utility, you know, to have a, you know, uh, you're trying to kill, uh, you know, a couple of birds with one stone. You're trying to solve problems at home for your political coherency, but also hit 
uh, desired targets outside of the border. Um, not gonna go why conspiracy theories are so important, but I want you to just have one thought uh, before I uh, finish. Those are populist theories of power. It is always all conspiracy theories basically are talking about, look, there is this insidious hour, uh, in our word, corrupt elite, which always conspires against the pure people. And pure people are always victimized. And this, of course, you can, you know, those elites come at least in, you know, from four places, uh, spatially, uh, enemy outside. If you are talking to Eastern European population or West or um, Russian population, you're saying, look, the EU, US, NATO, ultimate corruptive forces. These guys are the ones that are trying to subvert our, and this is why we don't have a good life. Uh, why, you know, like the fifth column, enemy within, who's that? Well, the bleeding heart liberals, uh, um, all people, uh, just Navalny, you know, who are trying to constantly create some sort of a chaos on the street and so on, but they conspire with the West. I mean, they've been paid, you know, to, you know, to, to again, try to disrupt our progress. Enemy above, liberal political, uh, and those are the most probably dangerous ones because these have very, very deep cultural roots across Europe and unfortunately in other comp uh, continents. These are the New World Order, Illuminati, Jewry, you name it, whoever it is who stops the progress of the nation. And uh, the enemy below, another you know, set, subset of disinformation that we're looking at, those are the ethnic minorities which are constantly wanting something from us, constantly trying to kind of like, you know, uh, uh, shake the boat in the stability, whereas actually they have to rally around the flag. So um, why actually you use this subset of longer and shorter streams of communication? Because you're trying to create moral panics among the population because moral panics are very useful again. Um, I would just finish uh, with something which I think might be a darker scenario, which I hope with our own joint efforts we can, and to end on a positive note, can divert. I want you to think that if you are looking at the future, and our kids are looking at the future where we already have face recognition and duplication which are very advanced in countries like China and perfected with the Soviet and updated Russian theory. If you have deep learning which we have, neural networking and um, just to let you know how many of you follow uh, in the local newspaper or in the local newspaper the sports reporting on high school games and so on. Any of you? Check. I do too sometimes, you know why? Because some of the content already is not written by a human. You just need to put the input and it will create a picture for you. So imagine if you, you know, for my nefarious purposes, I get all the information that I have harvested in somebody's weaknesses and I'm trying to target you with this information which is trying to alter your physical well-being let's say try to induce depression or stress or so on, or try to change your behavior. Don't go and vote today. You don't deserve that. And um, some more complex, such as fuzzy logic trees, we might be looking at the situation into which, and this is the bad scenario, which hopefully we can avoid, is um, at a very big speed, at a very a relatively low cost, to create a situation what we call induction to action with stream micro-targeted micro specifically information custom tailored based on your specific uh, fears, joys, and so on. Imagine that. And if you think that this hasn't been thought of, I want to look at uh, this um, um, quote, which I wanted to finish with. Uh, Vladimir Putin, who says, whoever will rule and master the AI in the next several years will be the ruler of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention and I hope for your questions. Thank you.